Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. You're looking at my uh, TRS-80 Model 3, number 2, which was used as a parts machine. The main reason for that was that I needed the parts for my other machines, but an even more important reason was the keyboard on this guy is completely dead. No response whatsoever. And uh, I tested it with uh, the keyboard out of my other Model 3 and uh, the motherboard seemed to be okay because that keyboard worked just fine but uh, this keyboard for some reason or other won't make a peep none of the keys work I don't even think the reset key works on this thing so I thought uh, looking at this thing the monitor does work the uh, the motherboard works, but of course I've removed the drives for use in the other Model 3 and uh, I removed some memory from it, 32K for the Model 1 expansion interface, you kind of see the empty sockets there, but other than that it's really good at heart, it does work. So as I was looking at it the other day I figured hey, can't be that hard to fix a keyboard, right? So let's give this a try. Little memory refresher here. Here's a Model 3 number 1 that received the drives and uh, is in full working condition. That, that's the keyboard I used to test number 2 with. And that one really doesn't need anything. The uh, RAM went into the uh, Model 1, the expansion interface that sits underneath the monitor. So that's a fully rammed up version of the Model 1 that doesn't really need anything other than some uh, disk drives, some original disk drives in the original cases. But that, uh, that can wait because it fully works and it's been tested with the HXC floppy emulator. So let's turn our attention to the item that needs to be repaired today, which is the keyboard on the TRS-80 Model 3. A few years ago I had a similar problem on this Oberheim OB-8 where the keyboard didn't work. As a matter of fact most of the keys on this one didn't work. Some did work which uh, let me rule out the electronics, uh, uh, the CPU boards inside and uh, I did find the problem what was causing these keys not to work and it wasn't just dirt but uh, using the experience I gained from this I'm going to assume that I can do a similar repair on the TRS-80 keyboard because the key contact mechanisms are very similar in the two. Here's our keyboard and uh, it's pretty simple, not much in here. Basically each of the keys has a momentary, a normally open momentary push button. And when you press the key the contact closes and uh, the keyboard scanning circuitry which is on the motherboard takes over and sees if the key has been closed. So the first thing that comes to mind of course is does do any or all or none of the keys work and that can simply be tested by uh, doing a continuity or a, an ohm a resistance test on some of the keys and seeing what that returns. So let's measure, measure some resistance. Uh, since my uh, third hand is out of order today we gotta set this up somehow. So pick a key, any key Let's do this one because it's going to be easy to lay on top of this flashlight so that the key is closed. And then, what are we expecting? Well, we're expecting something close to zero. May have 40, 50 ohms or so to still work, but anything above that is going to cause a problem. So, here are the contacts for the number 7 key and it comes back with 
approximately 20k. There's a problem right there. Just for grins, let's pick another key that's easy to press the number 9 key on the keypad. And that one says nothing. That one also says 20k. So, uh, obviously the uh, resistance of these keys has uh, the resistances have gone way up so even when they're closed the circuitry can't detect the switch closure so let's take out one of these keys and uh, see what's inside and what we can do to it to take out each key you have to desolder the four contacts I mean the way this works is these these two contacts and these two are permanently connected so the way this board works it actually uses in some places it uses these contacts as jumpers uh, PCB jumpers and they shouldn't be that hard to remove because it's a single sided PC board now you can use whatever method you prefer a solder braid a solder sucker or in this case because uh, we have to do this to a lot of the keys. I'm going to use the pump. This guy over here. Can you see him? And uh, all we got to do is place him. I guess just thick enough they just barely make it into the uh, nozzle here so we somewhat cleanly removed all of the solder let's see if we can get the key out now oh which one was it? number nine now it's not that simple because there's still plastic tabs grabbing onto the metal frame. Sometimes the keys will come out if you pull the actual, the whole mechanism will come out if you just pull the key, but sometimes they won't. And in this case, they won't. So, we need to do is use some more help to loosen the tabs let's see I guess we need some heavier machinery here We pull, push this tab in. And then sliding the knife in. See if this guy moves. And he does. Success. Here's the key mechanism. Has a little button on top. And let's see what's inside. Two tabs on the side, on opposing sides, that you will need to carefully lift so you don't break the tabs off. The voice of experience talking here. And once we do that on both sides, then the key should just, the mechanism should open up. So here's the top cover. 
Here is the uh, plunger guide. Here is the plunger itself, which has a carbon contact right in the center of it. And then we have the conductive surface that the uh, plunger, the carbon contact, completes. So this is where our problem lies. First thing we need to do is uh, burnish or clean the contacts on the bottom of the switch. They look clean, but uh, they obviously are contaminated and aren't conducting very well. And the best thing to do that with is to take metal polish. Now what I use is nothing specific. Uh, this is just what I had. And we take a little bit of it on a, a Q-tip and give the contacts on the bottom of the switch a workout. And then we can check to see what the, uh, what the resistance became. This is actually a lot easier because I can clip the meter on now. And what we do is, let's take the plunger, insert it in here, and uh, just put the push button guide on there. And now, out of circuit, it shows us about 1.6K. And that probably has something to do with the actual solder joints on the back of this. Uh, not making good contact with the probes, but now we are making good contact. Now, now it went to three, three k. So we definitely have too much resistance, at least apparently, in the metal part in here. So let's clean that up. So let's take a bit of the uh, metal polish. Shake it before use. Put a bit on the tip of a Q-tip. And then, rub the polish on those contacts to your heart's content. Well, it comes back nice and black, but that's that's inherent with metal polishes. I think they do that on purpose, that whatever you use this on, the Q-tip or whatever is always going to come, come back black because of what's in there. And it makes the consumer think that you really clean things up. But we'll just assume that that's what actually came off the uh, contact and there's still blackness coming off so it really doesn't look much different it's it's a bit shinier now but uh, but we'll find out in a minute if it actually made a difference what I'd like to do after that is give it a few drops of IPA and using the clean end of the uh, Q-tip, getting rid of the metal polish. The metal polish itself is actually conductive. If any of the stuff stays on here, the switch will never open properly. So you got to look at that groove in the middle and make sure that that's all nice and clean. And note that this is still coming back black. But let's see. Remember, it was about, it was between three and two and a half k before when we did it. So let's have a look and see what it says now. So here's the switch. Plunger. Uh, 
and look at that. We dropped 31 ohms. So there is one more step I'm going to take. This, in this case it isn't necessary because 30 ohms is more than good enough to make a good switch closure. But when I showed you the Oberheim OB8, one of the problems on that one was that the, uh, the carbon coating on this, on the contact here, actually had a very high resistance in the mega ohms. Obviously this one doesn't, this one works, but to complete things I'm going to show you what I did in the situation of the OB8 synthesizer where the carbon carbon part was basically non-conductive for, for all intents and purposes and uh, there's a couple of ways to fix that one way one I've used before I didn't use this on the OBA but OB8 but uh, if you go to an auto parts store you can buy a kit that is for a rear window defroster it's a rear window defroster repair kit and basically the rear window defroster has uh, a bunch of conductive tracks on it well they have some resistance of course and you run your 12 volts through it and because of the resistance they heat up and then melt the ice but cargo rubs against it and stuff and if you break the tracks anywhere then your rear window defogger doesn't work so really what the rear window defogger repair kit is it's a tiny bottle of a cleaning solution which I think is just alcohol and you're supposed to clean uh, observe for any breaks in the rear window de-icer and uh, clean them and then there's another very tiny bottle with conductive paint that is orange which is the color that most of the rear window de-icers uh, de look like and what you do is with the paint you close whatever cracks or, or scratches there are in it thus completing the circuit so really when I saw that okay that's conductive paint what if we just paint this carbon uh, circle here with the conductive paint and that does work the thing I don't trust is that that paint probably isn't fully flexible when uh, it dries and when you repeatedly push down this plunger and deform this part the uh, conductive paint may start to crack and you end up with the same uh, problem you had before so uh, here's another way to do this and uh, how to fix the carbon contact over here and again let me repeat on this one it's really not necessary this isn't in that bad of shape we've got 30 ohms which is more than enough but while we're at it let me show you how to go one step further and see how low we can get the resistance of this switch assembly so what we need is a small conductive disc preferably self-adhesive that we can uh, use to stick on top of the uh, carbon contact. So the material is, uh, is a no-brainer, not very expensive. It's metal tape that you use on air conditioning ducts and stuff like that. The properties are that the tape itself is really, is really weak. It'll tear easily, but it works great for putting it on static surfaces. But it has really good adhesive, a really good adhesive backing that's heat resistant because it goes on to heating and cooling ducts. So all we got to figure out now is we need a disc the size of the center contact. So how do we do that? And uh, here's how I came up with it. Now, I have to be honest with you, this isn't my idea. When I was trying to fix the OB8 synthesizer, I searched high and low, and uh, I found a fellow who was selling these little discs, self-adhesive metal discs, that you put on the carbon contact, and that fixed the problem. Uh, the problem was more that these things were like 20 or 30 cents a disc. So you have a 61-key keyboard, you know, things kind of add up, and 
it's just ridiculous to buy a, a sheet of metal tape with that has discs punched out if of course you can find a way to do it so the original idea is not mine however how to make your own is mine and uh, the way that works is you get yourself a hollow punch set such as this which I picked up cheaply and all these things are are metal hollow punches this is 1 8 inch which is the exact diameter of the contact in here so uh, shouldn't really do it this this is kind of uh, flexible but I'm going to do it anyway and there really is no scientific way of what it really boils down to is how hard do you hit the punch because ideally you want to punch through the uh, metal tape but not through the backing so you can just peel it off and add it to the plunger but it's not as easy as it sounds to get it just right usually non-flexible surfaces are better such as a concrete floor or something but for demonstrative purposes I'll just put this on here and put a love tap. So what it now boils down to is can I get the disc? Can I get that disc out of there? Alright, we're gonna need some tweezers. This might be a fail because I can't get it out. Oh, I destroyed it. Okay. But see, that's the nice thing about it. You mess up, you just get some new ones. So, harder tap this time. And, did that work? did except the backing is still on it so I'm going to need some optical help here to see what the hell I'm doing there's a circle well we can't see it properly but the backing is still attached to it but it's slightly offset so if I take another pair of pliers, tweezers I mean, I should be able to remove I should be able to remove the backing from it. Oh, there you go. So now let's identify the sticky side. There's our sticky side. Straighten the disc, which isn't perfectly circular. And now, place it on the carbon part did kind of an ugly job. It's not perfectly centered. The disc isn't perfectly round, but that doesn't matter. It's on there. Then we need a flat surface. Found out the hard way. My desktop is kind of textured. So you need something flat to press it down against so the adhesive goes into place. And it also flattens the disc somewhat. Now, on my OB-8, uh, this kind of an approach has held up for years. So, yeah, it looks a bit ugly, but it should do the job. So, plunger goes in, spring, the button and guide. 
Now, what were, were we at? 30 ohms. And there you go. 1.3 ohms. The nice thing about it is, if you have any doubts about the adhesive holding, is since you're always, every time you press down on the button, you're reseating the adhesive. Oh, did it just show higher? No. It is kind of pressure sensitive, but 1.8 ohms is more than low enough for this to work. Now, in order to reassemble this, we just put the uh, top part. It snaps right in. And our last test says, <laughs> with that thing in place, it's going up. Probably because I can't, the uh, plunger travel has been reduced by this part. So it's not pressing as hard. Look at that. So when putting that thing back, oh, there you go. So it, it still varies, but uh, I guess if you hammer on your keys, you can get really low resistance. So now it looks like we have a switch that works perfectly. Now we're up to 20 ohms. 24. Well, so that kind of concludes the part where what we need to do to clean a switch like this. Metal polish on the uh, contacts inside, followed by cleaning with IPA because the uh, metal polish is conductive, and then putting a small disc that we punch out from metalized tape onto the uh, plunger, and that should fix it. And that's the good news about it is, so we fixed the switch. That's great. However, there are a lot of switches here. <laughs> These all need to be removed and uh, gone through the same procedure as I just did with one switch. Now I know many of you would love nothing more than being able to sit down and watch me do this to every switch, but uh, uh, Nah, I don't think so. So, uh, what needs to be done is desolder all the contacts, pry out the switches, go through this procedure with them, put them back in. And, uh, well, you know how to remove them now. You know how to, uh, you know how to clean up each switch individually. All the rest of them are the same. Yeah, there's a little bit more mechanical work in, involved in the uh, space bar because it has a single switch, but it has supports on each side, so you don't have to hit the space bar in the middle, but you can pretty much hit it anywhere and it'll register. But other than that, it's, it, it's the same kind of switch. And uh, so now the fun begins for me. And we'll see you back when they have all been cleaned. So here's a progress update. I desoldered all of them and decided to, instead of prying out each switch individually, uh, to lift the PC board. So there are a bunch of screws that held the PCB to the metal frame and I gently, with soldering iron in hand, started lifting it and uh, heating any pin that caused resistance and the whole thing lifted off. So now prying these things out isn't as difficult because you no longer run into the danger of having some of the uh, pins not being completely desoldered and uh, damaging the switch or the PCB while removing it. I know that the only thing holding these in place now are the two tabs in here so it's much safer to remove these. One of the downsides is if you look at this closely some of the uh, some of the pads got ripped off and generally those were pads that did not have uh, a trace attached to them. I guess the ones with a trace give you just enough heatsink capability for the trace, uh, for the pad not to lift off, but these that were just the pads, well, actually that isn't true because what we're looking at here 
does have a trace coming out of it. So I guess some pads are just naturally uh, weak, weakly bonded and come off and that happens and you can fix that later on. Of course it's a problem of two next to each other come out because then when you put the switch back in you can't really solder one side of the switch firmly to the PCB but again it's held in place by the frame by the metal frame so this should all be okay and uh, this board will need a good cleaning and then we'll remove all the switches and go through the uh, cleaning the switch procedure so here's I punched out a few more of the uh, discs and uh, you know in the beginning take some getting used to you mess up a lot you go to deep or not deep enough but as you're doing many of these you get better and better at it and uh, able to create uh, your yields gonna get much higher and this brings up a good subject because I figured there may be some of you who think that I'm using false economy in doing this myself instead of going out and buying them and a slight correction I mean I looked up my records and uh, the uh, the discs that I had bought previously were like 38 cents each so for a 61 key keyboard that comes out to roughly $20 now another thing is, is when you get the discs first, uh, you need practice. You're going to destroy some of the discs. The material used on the commercial discs uh, I got wasn't as flexible as this tape, and uh, if you mishandled them, they would break in half. So I would say I used at least uh, 10 to 15 extras, destroying them in the process of putting them on. and. Uh, not a big deal in itself, but if you don't use enough extras, you're going to get caught with your keyboard disassembled at 3 o'clock in the morning running out of these discs. You don't want that to happen. Second of all, this is these basically cost nothing. Yes, you have to buy the uh, hole punch, the hollow punch set, but that cost me about 5 or $6. And uh, I plan on... I'm... I plan on doing more keyboards. I'm sure more are going to come my way and I'm going to need more of these. So this is the better approach. But if you think you're only going to do a single one, then maybe you should find... I don't even know if they still sell these, but uh, maybe that's the approach. But this isn't really that hard. And once you get the hang of it, it goes very quickly. Enough talk. Now I have to pull out all of the contacts and uh, clean them up. See you in a few hours. The first part didn't take all that long. I got uh, the uh, all of the switches out and disassembled. Breaking a few tabs, of course, which I'm going to have to address as I put things back. But it was a lot easier to remove the, uh, uh, the key contacts from underneath because the tabs were readily available. And uh, so all that remains now. Oh, and before I forget, I still have to remove the reset switch and clean that one up too. Now, of course, the, the drudgery of polishing every single one of these awaits me. And that is going to take a few hours. But I won't bore you with the details. And we'll be back. So this is the next day and a few hours of work later. Everything's back in place. All the switches have been cleaned as I outlined them before. There's three repairs here where the pads were ripped out. But uh, all in all the board's in pretty good shape. The switch is all tested good, of course, on the uh, ohm meter. And all I have left to do is clean up the remainder of the keys and put them back. They're sitting back there waiting to be reinserted. And then we will plug the keyboard into the machine and uh, watch the fruits of our labor. All right, I'm going to let pessimism reign 
which means I'm going to leave things in bits and pieces while we test the keyboard. So, uh, here's a keyboard with everything, uh, all the keys we installed. We need to attach this ground strap over here. that uh, the enter key on the keypad is missing and that got cannibalized for model 3 number 1 and if you can see the uh, period right carrot key is missing actually this one was cannibalized for my number 1 model 3 and this one was broken off on this keyboard when I got it. And the switches are still there, but the key tops and the uh, containing stocks were broken off. Probably small house pets may have caused this, because otherwise, how do you break off a key right in the middle over here? But the keys should still be functional, but you're going to have a hard time playing games that use the left and right carrot. But anyway, uh, let's see, everything is there. As a last step, I'm going to put the keyboard cover on because, let's see, it's kind of hidden. But uh, on this side of the keyboard over here, there is the power switch, which basically has both a AC line, the AC line, both poles exposed. So put your palm on it or your hand strays you get a nasty surprise so we'll put this on and cover up this area and here we go so the neck lights up and it's saying cassette the reason for that is is that I don't have any drives installed right now so, the uh, first key we try is the enter key, and it asks us for the memory size. And boom! So the enter key works. Let's see. So let's go through the keys. Uh, numeric keypad first. Period zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are all there. Top row of the keyboard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, colon, underscore, no, not underscore, hyphen, and break. That works. Testing the equals with the shift key, the asterisk, right and left parent, single quote, the uh, ampersand, percent, dollar, pound, double quotes, and exclamation mark. Let's see, did that all work? Yep. So anyway, the shift key works. Well, let's see if this side works. Yeah, that side works too. See if the uh, 
amputated inner key works, and that works too. To the uh, second row, left tabs it, I mean right tabs it, left single steps back, at P O uh, I U Y T R E W Q up. I guess the up uh, does a left uh, left square bracket, whereas down just goes down. Let's see, can you shift that one? Nope. Those are there. Finally, A S D F G H J K L. Semicolon, enter, and clear. That's all good. And uh, Z X C V B N M, comma, period of the amputated key, slash, and then shift. So, and probably the most important keyboard. The space bar. No auto repeat. Oh, yes, it does auto repeat. Cool. So the keyboard's good. Let me just add that this fix will also work for Model 4 keyboards. Model. <clears throat> Model 4 uh, keyboards are similar to this in construction, but they do have some extra keys. They have F1, F2, F3 on top of the numeric keypad. They have a control key over here and an uppercase key here, I think. I'd have to look it up. They have a few extra keys, but the, me the mechanisms are exactly the same, and you can use the same approach to fix a uh, model TRS-80 Model 4 keyboard as we used on this one. So finally, let's see if uh, we broke anything else. And I think, uh, you know, let's see if it loads off a disk. Another thing I noticed was that the, uh, the screen height was maladjusted. The characters were really small. So I bumped that up a little bit and made sure that it fills uh, the vertical space a little bit more, so you're going to notice all the characters being taller now. But uh, we'll take a copy of TRS DOS and let her rip. And uh, there you go TRS DOS Model 3. See, it's pretty much occupying the entire vertical space now. Could probably make it a little wider too, but I can't get my tool into the uh, H with coil without removing the board from the monitor, so we'll just leave it like that for now. Once the date, let's give it a uh, authentic date, time, and there you go, the drive works. Will it give us a directory? Yes. And uh, if I could type. OK, so it's running the mem test now. And, uh, Looks like we can say that this machine is pretty much functional right now, but uh, that ran pretty quickly, didn't it? Oh, and I bet you I know why. Remember I told you about all the cannibalization? Well, this machine only has 16K right now, even though it proudly declares 48, but it took 16K out and put it into the Model 1. And uh, 
So it has 16K and DOS probably uses a significant part of that. Let's see just how much. Remember, it's 16K raw mem. And it tells us that it has about 5.5K free after the OS load. So uh, it does need more memory, needs a second drive, and needs to be put back together. But other than that, it seems to be functional. Thanks for watching. Support the channel, please. Uh, let the thumbs uh, point skyward. If you think the uh, video deserves it, of course, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button so you get notified of all new arrivals. And most important of all, leave me a comment. It doesn't have to be good, but it should be constructive. Thanks, everybody. See you later.